Doctors do not respect Gua Sha. Mm, this seems like a gimmick and whoops. Well, there are some important arguments happening on the internet. The tea is hot. It is not this tea. And I implore you to watch this video in its entirety. Please watch the entire thing because there is so much going on here beyond the surface. But at surface level, what exactly is going on? Doctors do not respect Gua Sha. Mm, this seems like a gimmick. And oops, you can see how much I respect this tool. Likely because they haven't even ever used one. I have never used a Gua Sha tool before. Mm, okay, well, in that case, why don't you tell us how Gua Sha works? <laughs> this will, you know, kind of help in pushing the fluid back, you know, out of the skin, out of the, out of the tissue. Going to help move some lymphatic fluid. Oh, you're so close. Improved lymphatic circulation is like a bonus of gua sha, but the real meat of gua sha is its ability to wear down fascial tightness and fascial adhesions and break up congestion or stagnation in the capillaries or your blood system. That's why it can even heal disease like hepatitis. It can increase your immunity and sculpt your face. Ah, oh, but you know what? It's okay. Doctors don't need to be experts in gua sha. They aren't trained in Chinese medicine. If you want to know how to do gua sha or about gua sha, ask an acupuncturist. It's what we're trained in. We're happy to help. So the dogs aren't into gua sha. That's okay. What are they into? But let's take a look. The thing that has made the biggest difference in reducing morning puffiness and wrinkles is my sleep and glow pillow. Sleep pillow. Got it. That is very honestly why I created the deep puffer to help reduce the look of swelling and inflammation. Got it. So here's the thing. I have spoken to or interacted with every single one of these people. Oh, and gua sha is not even this stone. We need to talk about all this. <laughs> so wait, who am I? And what is my relationship to all of these people? Well, I'm a medical esthetician who has worked alongside and with both doctors and dermatologists in medical settings, in emergency medicine, as well as I'm a nutritionist and a personal trainer, even though I don't do those two things currently. But I've also learned about gua sha in aesthetic settings but I found out later that it wasn't true gua sha. It was fake gua sha, which we're going to discuss later. <laughs> but let me share a little bit about how I actually know or have interacted with all of these people. First is Dr. Dre. She's an amazing dermatologist and we don't chat much online, but I've met her multiple times in person. She's amazing. Dr. Shereen Idris is someone that I've never met in person and I don't know how many conversations we've really had online, but we have shared videos or reacted to each other's videos back and forth. And I actually know many people who know her in real life or who have have worked with her and they have nothing but good things to say about her. And colleagues have always discussed her in a positive light. And I've actually spoken with and done videos with Sandra before specifically on gua sha because when I originally learned about gua sha, I thought it was a rock that people rubbed on their face. And when I realized that I was probably wrong about that, I went and sought out traditional Chinese medical practitioners who understand this better than I do. And we actually filmed a Zoom interview that I was planning on turning into a YouTube video. I still plan on doing that, but the editing company that I was working with at the time did not not do the video it's justice. And the editors at the company that I was working with back then couldn't really cite the sources or put the video together the way it needed to be done. So that Zoom recording still exists. I actually still plan to turn that into a video and publish it. I just have not had the time or the energy currently. And it kind of hasn't been a top priority. And I do feel terrible about it. But please remember that a discussion is not necessarily an endorsement. But outside of the people, what is my relationship with all of these tools or pillows? The first is the sleeping pillow that Dr. Dre recommended. I've actually purchased this and used it before. I didn't absolutely love it. And actually, fun fact, currently I've been trying every pillow under the sun, uh, all the ergonomic stuff for my sleep because my sleep has been absolutely abysmal due to emotional reasons and other reasons. But I did try the pillow that Dr. Dre recommended. For myself, I found that it was better to train me to like sleep on my back. And I actually had some issues with mouth dryness, but that's a topic for another video. The long story is that I bought it, I tried it and I loved the fabric. It just wasn't the right shape for me. And what is my relationship with this pillow talk tool? <laughs> I had actually been intending to purchase this and review it since this came out. I actually wanted to purchase all of the Dr. Shireen Idris products, but haven't had a chance. Again, I've gone through some really rough stuff this year and just haven't had the time or energy or mental bandwidth to purchase, to test and to try this. My friend Monica, who is a content creator, was someone who I was speaking to and she actually gave this to me. This was hers. It didn't work for her, so she passed it forward and I was fine using it. 
it. The cap has kind of exploded on me a couple times and I wasn't using it super regularly because again, there were times this year that I couldn't even complete my skincare routine and I was relying on makeup wipes because I couldn't get out of bed. I think I've shared this before, but I once had to get 24 cavities filled in one day because I wasn't brushing my teeth because I couldn't get out of bed and take care of myself one time in the past. And this year it's been rough, okay? But Monica gave me this, I was using it off and on. And then because I was traveling and it exploded in my suitcase, I could not continue using it. As of today, I'm putting it back in my routine and will continue testing it. Overall first impressions are that I liked it. The formula was okay. I loved the roller. I am going to compare this to my other facial depuffing tools. And just as a reference, here is my puffy face from crying. And um, I am becoming very well versed in facial depuffers because of what I am trying to depuff out of my face and my angst as of recently. And then what is my relationship with Hua Sha? Well, as an esthetician, I've been given these rocks so many times and been told to like rub them on people's faces, but that is not actually true Gua Sha. I have never performed true Gua Sha, nor have I ever received true Gua Sha. And you know, Gua Sha isn't this little pink stone that you rub on the skin for lymphatic drainage. Um, it's actually a bruising, a scraping of the skin that often happens on the body, not just the face. And it can actually be done with multiple tools, not just a specific Gua Sha stone. I learned a whole lot. <laughs> I had misconceptions about this until I actually spoke with Sandra, the woman in this video, and learned directly from her about the practices of Eastern medicine and how this tool allows someone to perform the treatment of Gua Sha. Afterwards, Sandra did send me some of her products. And then since then, I have actually purchased some of her products and gifted them to others. And again, I have rubbed a little rock around my face. I have rubbed this little rock around my face and my neck, but that is very different from the true practice of gua sha, which again, even at home, I've never done it myself nor on someone else. But also what is my relationship with facial puffiness? <laughs> well, I have had arguably one of the roughest years of my life and cried more than I can remember. <laughs> like, it's been okay. Outside of the puffy cryingness, I did used to have a more rounded out face. Some people attributed this to weight loss, but you can lose weight without losing any of the shape of your face. So I would say that my facial shape contour and that change actually has come from treatments that I do on myself as well as ones that I do on other. These are specifically radio frequency, which can help break down adipose or fat tissue as well as microcurrent. So I have used depuffing tools that have worked over time, such as the new face and the Nebulift N1 and the Amaro, but outside of the long term facial sculpting, contouring, and changing. I have puffy <laughs> under eyes. I have a puffy <laughs> face. The tears cause me to snot. The fluid builds up in my face and it is so terrible. And I need to depuff it almost every day because I still cry almost every single day. That's embarrassing. Now, all of this being said, let's break down what's happening in this video one by one. Let's also break down the conversations that are happening around this one by one and start to fill in some of the gaps that aren't being discussed or really can't be discussed in a short 60 second video. And please, again, remember that a discussion is not an endorsement. So just because we're talking about this or this does not mean that I am endorsing. It. First, let's break down this video one by one, starting with the lymphatic fluid drainage. This is quite honestly what a lot of doctors and estheticians think of fake gua sha. We see these pink little stones, we see people rubbing them around their face, and the benefit is that you are providing circulation to the skin and potentially pushing and reintroducing fluid from the little capillaries and in between the little capillaries in our skin back into the rest of the body. However, this is not true gua sha, nor is true gua sha, the scraping technique, actually lymphatic drainage. This is something that I used to believe. When it comes to lymphatic drainage, you could use like a stone or a tool, but you don't necessarily have to. You can just use your fingers. Lymphatic drainage is a very light touching and kind of brushing of the skin. It is not vigorous or deep. When we think about lymphatic drainage, we have to talk about lymphatic fluid. Our body has this fluid that exists all throughout our bodies, and it exists basically in between our veins and capillaries. Now, our heart pumps blood, right? We have blood vessels and veins, and the heart is the big fan fancy muscle that allows that blood to pump. But we don't have a pump for our lymphatic fluid. So things such as exercise or massage are required to help stimulate and move lymphatic fluid through the body. Our body does kind of move it around naturally, but sometimes it could use a helping hand. And that's why massage and specifically exercise muscle movement is so fantastic for us. The total lymphatic flow in the body can be four to five liters a day. It's a ton of fluid. And yes,
yes, we do have lymphatic vessels, but there's no major pump for them. And that's why lymphatic drainage can be really helpful if people feel that they have a lot of fluid buildup in their face, or if people are sick, you ever go to the doctor and they kind of feel your lymph nodes? Well, the lymph nodes aren't just here, they're also in the armpits, in the groin, by the breast, in the other areas of the body. And it's so important that lymphatic fluid is regularly moving throughout the body, which is again, another reason that exercise is important, or you can use massage and techniques to help move lymphatic fluid through. And again, a lot of people, including estheticians, and I'm just calling it as it is, a lot of people do this like aggressive massage of the face and they're like, oh, we get the fluid down the neck. First off, you only can drain it on one side based on our anatomy, except for people who are like medical anomalies, like me with my one kidney. But for 99.9% .9 of the population, one side. And um, lymphatic drainage is not an aggressive rubbing. Lymphatic drainage is a very, very light touch. And anything deeper actually gets into other forms of massage, such as petrissage, which is kind of like a kneading motion, or even like deep tissue massage. And again, the lymph vessels are very tiny, they're very delicate. And you know, if we're getting fluid, lymph fluid from in between our capillaries and in our skin back into the entire system, it's a very light stroking motion. It's not this intense massage. And that's why a lot of people do lymphatic fluid drainage wrong. <laughs> the lymph nodes are very close to the skin. You don't have to go deep and hard. Now, true gua sha treatments done with a gua sha stone are exactly that. They are deep and they are hard. They are scraped across the skin to cause almost this bruising underneath the skin and to move what is referred to as qi or energy in the body. At least that's what some people who have studied ancient Chinese medicine and Eastern medicine believe. But again, a true gua sha treatment that is deep and hard is very different from the light feathery touch of lymphatic drainage. Gua sha and lymphatic drainage are not the same thing. You can use a gua sha stone and you can gently feather it across the skin in a light feathery motion or any other tool to help with lymphatic drainage if done correctly. But inherently, these two things are very, very different. And again, I did not know any of this until I started speaking to experts who understood this traditional Chinese medicine and gua sha and actually went through school and studied emergency medicine and learned about the body and learned about lymph vessels and lymph fluid. I didn't know any of this stuff and I had gotten it wrong for many years. But there is a difference between true versus fake gua sha. And admittedly, a lot of people on the internet, I will say probably maybe a majority of estheticians don't understand what true gua sha is and how it is different than just rubbing a rock around our face and calling it lymphatic drainage. And we also have to talk about what gua sha can actually do. Because as Dr. Shreen Idris called out in her comment, some of these things may need a lot more medical studies to be done before we can truly recommend them. Let's talk about what real gua sha actually is and where that name even comes from. It wasn't until I got on that Zoom call and Sandra explained to me that the words gua and sha actually come from Chinese. The word gua is to scrape and sha is actually a color. Um, specifically the red, the kind of redness that comes from scraping the skin. It's otherwise known medically as petechiae. And I actually asked her what's the difference between sha being petechiae and echinosis, like a large bruise, versus uh, kind of this pinpoint bleeding. And she explained that the sha part of gua sha is related to that kind of pinpoint pricking that you can actually see in the medical gua sha that is done on some people. Um, and she also explained that the same thing happens during cupping. And petechiae, echimosis, all of these fancy words are basically bleeding underneath the skin. It's when there is blood that pulls up under the skin. And in traditional Chinese medicine or in people who practice medical gua sha like Sandra, this is seen as helping to increase circulation. This is seen as a physical sign that the treatment is being done properly. You know, usually the body is able to break this down and kind of reduce this color over time. But that's where the word gua sha actually comes from. And gua sha, as Sandra explained to me, is not a tool. It's not a little rock. It's an actual practice. And she even stated it should never be done at home if it is true gua sha, unless you are a licensed medical practitioner doing this and you've been trained to do so. Or, you know, many people have done this for hundreds, if not thousands of years. She explained that her aunt would do this to her. If this is something culturally that you grew up with or that someone who understands this knows how to do, that is a way of respecting the culture. And that was fascinating for me to hear as someone who thought that gua sha was just like, oh, you know, you slap the rock on the face and charge people extra money for it. And, oh, it's pink and it's made of resin. It's not even a real stone, right? We've all seen those pink little doohickeys, right? Right? Okay, right. <laughs> well, this practice 
practice has happened for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And there are ancient texts, specifically from Chinese medicine, that speak about this practice. And medical gua sha is usually done to the body, not the face. It's not until, you know, the Western world really heard about gua sha that we started talking about facial gua sha, which is doing gua sha or facial stroking or massage with a tool on the face. But again, that is very different than the body scraping that is done. And again, as Sandra explained to me, it's usually done in honor of this traditional Chinese medicine and as a way for some people to potentially boost immunity or to help circulation throughout the body or again circulate this qi which some people believe is an energy that is in the body that they can kind of move through. Now let's pause here because there has always been stigma in the western world versus the eastern world and eastern medicine versus western medicine and I'm not just talking about traditional Chinese medicine but even things like from India like Ayurvedic medicine. There are practices that have been done for hundreds if not thousands of years in eastern medicine that in western medicine we just don't look at or like don't even pay attention to. Now sometimes western medicine does pay attention and does medical studies that make it palatable to a more western medical audience so that western medicine can get the benefits. For example meditation. Meditation has been used for thousands of years and many people in eastern cultures understand the major benefits it can have. Well in western medicine a lot of people shrugged it off for years, there was no science backing it up, and it wasn't until scientists literally put EEGs and brain monitors onto monks that they were like, wow, we can actually see some quantitative, measurable scientific data showing that this is amazing. So there is this discrepancy between Eastern medicine and Western medicine. Eastern medicine is also more preventative, meaning that you do certain things or certain practices to prevent something from happening, whereas Western medicine in general is more reactive, meaning you kind of wait until you get sick before you go into the doctors, right? But there has always been this stigma around Eastern medicine and specifically around gua sha, so much that there was actually a movie made about this. Now, I haven't personally seen this movie. If someone has, please explain it further in the comments. But my understanding of the plot line or the story of this movie, um, it was about a young boy and his grandfather who came from China where they practiced Eastern medicine and they came over to the West, to the United States. And one day the boy was sick, so the grandfather performed gua sha scraping on the young boy and it caused the young boy to bruise. And again, just like in Eastern medicine, like he did at home, it helped the young boy uh, work through his illness and heal a little bit faster. But the problem is that when the little boy went to school, his teacher saw that he had these scrapes and these bruises on him and they thought that he was being abused at home. And it was this story about how a treatment for one person looked like abuse to another who didn't understand the cultural nuance of it. And that just goes to show that something that has been used and a part of culture and history for thousands of years may or may not be respected by another culture that looks for different markers or medical studies to say that something does or doesn't work. Even the ancient Egyptians, or was it the Romans? Uh, somebody fact check me. It was either the ancient Romans or the ancient Egyptians. Yes, I did take a course on ancient Egyptian medicine, but they used to put soiled baby diapers on their face, like urine soaked diapers. And they said it would help them have glowing skin. And again, people probably look at that and they're like, oh my God, the Egyptians did what? Like that's terrible, right? However, we now know that uric acid, which yes, can come from urine, is a wonderful exfoliant. And it just goes to show that the Western world or a more, dare I say, quote unquote, modern world looks at some of these traditional practices and cultures very differently if they are not viewed or compared through the same metrics. And that can be very dismissive. Now back to this video that Sandra did, she also mentions things such as boosting immunity or helping with hepatitis B. We're going to talk about all of that in a second, but let's touch on what Sandra said about doctors not needing to know gua sha and about how traditional Chinese medical practitioners are trained in this, but Western doctors and dermatologists or not. This is kind of true. <laughs> Doctors and dermatologists, at least here in the US, are not specifically taught acupuncture or acupressure as a part of their training. Now there are different types of medical doctors. There are MDs and DOs. DOs are a specific subset of medical doctors that actually do touch the body and um, they actually use touch and pressure points on the body to both diagnose, to aid in their diagnosis, as well as to provide some potential treatment. Now I'm not sure if acupuncture or acupressure is discussed in DO training training. I believe it is, but I could be wrong. And then again, in most MD training, I don't believe it's taught at all. And that also goes for things like nutrition. You know, most doctors get maybe a day of nutrition, maybe two. Nutrition is not always taught in medical curriculum. And unless someone is specifically a dietitian or has taken the time out to actually study nutrition, a lot of that is not taught in most regular curriculum. And that's important. You know, many doctors or dermatologists who most of probably have not studied traditional Chinese medicine have also not
not studied over-the-counter product chemistry. For example, doctors and dermatologists specifically are doctors of disorders and diseases of the skin. They understand tons of chemistry, everything from blood gas levels to prescribing medications, but dermatologists are not necessarily experts in over-the-counter products that you can go and pick up from the store. Again, unless a doctor or a dermatologist educates themselves in that and starts learning about those things and learns the different brands and what's available over the counter, that is not necessarily a part of their curriculum the way that prescribing medications or the chemistry and interaction of those prescription medications on the skin is. Some doctors do the extra education on over-the-counter product chemistry, on nutrition or on acupressure and acupuncture, but some, if not many, don't. And here's the thing, acupressure and acupuncture has gone on for centuries. It is something that is ingrained in culture and often passed down from grandparents to their children and their children's children. I am not fully aware of the educational requirements to become an acupuncturist or to become someone who does acupressure. I believe that you have to have at least a master's degree. And I do know that the education qualifications are different in the US versus in places like China, where Eastern medicine is more widely practiced and appreciated. There are acupuncture schools. There's specifically schools uh, that teach traditional Chinese medicine, and I believe you can get a doctorate in that. There's specifically one called ACTM, but I don't know a lot about that practice or that curriculum. I believe that Sandra did explain it to me, and again, that's why she has all those letters behind her name, because I believe she is a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner or doctor, or I think she, I don't actually know which one it is. I will make sure that we cite our sources and put it up here, but some people do pursue degrees in this. You can also get a degree in massage therapy, which sometimes goes over things like acupressure or acupuncture in a part of that curriculum. And again, there are such things as traditional Chinese medical doctors. However, they do not necessarily go through the same training as an MD or a DO does here in America. Someone could have both and have done both, but those two curriculum, at least here in the West, are completely different. Now, I don't know about how that is in the East. I do believe believe that it is much more respected in the East because that is where it came from. And in certain Asian countries, I do believe that there are actual like traditional Chinese medical programs, but please ask an expert on that because I do not know. But as Sandra mentioned, it is true. Doctors are not necessarily taught about acupressure, acupuncture, or gua sha. But then again, doctors aren't necessarily taught about sleeping pillows or about over-the-counter product chemistry either. That doesn't mean they can't go learn those things and they can't become an expert in those things and use their expertise along with their newfound knowledge to make things. But it does go to show that just because you're an MD in America doesn't mean that you understand traditional Chinese medicine practices in China or just because you're a TCM in China doesn't mean that you understand medications or therapies that are used and practiced in the Western world. And I did want to point this out because we can see that Sandra almost holds up the fact that Dr. Dre was talking about a pillow or Dr. Idris was talking about her product, not necessarily as an ad hominem attack, but almost to insinuate that there is financial bias here. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. I don't know, I can't say. But what I can say is that it does make sense for a doctor or a derm to share something that they use, that they like from their personal personal experience and their opinion that they had a positive interaction with. I also do think that certain sponsorships or certain promotions are okay as long as a doctor or a derm or an individual actually loves the brand. When you think about it, when anyone, whether they're a doctor, a derm, an esthetician, or an influencer is talking about a brand, especially as doctors or derms or estheticians or anyone who shares information on the internet for free, people are investing their experience and their time for free to share with others. They should be allowed to talk about things they like. And if an influencer or a doctor on YouTube is investing in a brand by buying it and by talking about something that they love, and then that brand reaches out to that doctor or that person and says, we want to sponsor you, as long as that is authentic, as long as it represents the true opinions of that person talking, I personally don't see an issue with that. What I do see an issue with is when there is a financial incentive that sways or biases what that person says. I think we've all seen influencers who like hold up a product that they've never even used and it still has the packaging on it. They're like, ah, I I love it and I don't even have before and after pictures and I can't even pronounce it or know how to say it. That is awful and that is a major issue. And this is frankly what deteriorates trust in the industry. And it truly because then any honest person who is being compensated to speak about something that they've already loved or share something that they believe in is automatically not believed because there is so much in the industry. And that's the price that people who are speaking about these things honestly have to pay for people who went and pumped a, a dink donk coin. And if you don't know about Logan, Paul, and what's his 
brother Jake Paul and the fact that they launched a dink doink coin and, and stole money from people allegedly. Oh my God, I, I cannot help you. <laughs> and again, it's like that that absolutely deteriorates trust online. And it's why we have to be critics and skeptics about everything, including what we're going to discuss in just a second about Gua Sha. Because unfortunately, some of those inauthentic sponsorships make it absolutely trash for us trying to navigate the world online and just enjoy our content and learn something or find a truly honest, unbiased review. But all of that being said, it is insinuated by Sandra, the traditional Chinese medical practitioner in her video that Dr. Idris or Dr. Dre, you know, are pushing products. But Sandra didn't bother to mention that she also creates one of her own products, just the way Dr. Idris does. Sandra has a company called Lanshin that sells gua sha stones and gua sha spoons and the tools that you need to do this practice, whether it's the medical scraping on the back or the gentle lymphatic drainage that you can do on the face. Sandra is an expert in her field and she respects the history and the culture of traditional Chinese medicine, which is why she brings authentic gua sha to people and sells them online. Kind of the way that Dr. Idris is a dermatologist and has a dermatology practice and loves over-the-counter products and took her expertise to create a product that she believes in and helps other people with online. Again, it doesn't make any of these women or these actions bad. I just think it is important to point out that every single person here definitely has products that they like or recommend or that work for them or that they created and are selling. But if a dermatologist who is speaking about a product that she likes or holding up a product that she created, if that's being attacked or used as an example, we are, at least from this clip, missing the nuance that Sandra as well has products that she recommends or products that she creates and sells herself too. This is also getting into a conversation about misinformation and why it gets spread so quickly and why it's so hard to debunk misinformation and it's so hard to be a critic and a skeptic. Now, we're gonna talk about that and specifically what chemistry PhD lab Muffin Beauty Science had to say about this because she created an awesome chart. But before we do that, let's go back to what Dr. Shereen Idris actually said in her comment and what else is happening inside of this video. Dr. Idris mentions in her comment that she never said that she had or hadn't tried gua sha. And remember that even this comment does not confirm or deny if Dr. Idris has used gua sha. And as we discussed earlier, there is real gua sha, the scraping of the skin and the practice versus fake gua sha, which are these little stones uh, that people sell. We do not know which, if any of these, Dr. Idris has tried. Dr. Idris also mentions that she wasn't tagged. And I mean, it is always great to cite your sources. While it isn't a requirement to posting on the internet, it really is something that at least I personally really believe in. And I get that some people don't have the energy or the ability to do it. Uh, it takes a lot of time to edit these videos and to cite sources properly, but it is important. And if you'll notice, like every single one of our videos has like a little source in the lower left-hand corner, or it might be your right hand. No, it's your left hand. It's my right hand. Ha ha, technology. But you'll notice there's purple text down there that cites the source. So that if you're curious about something that I said, or if you want to fact check me, you can find out where that came from and actually do that due diligence. Now, ideally for every single claim that someone makes, they would have three independently verified credible sources. That's what's called journalistic integrity. And it's so important, right? We want three separate sources to back up a claim. But even just citing the sources is something that I personally think is important. I didn't do from the beginning, but I later on started to do because it is important so that you can look into and fact check me, or you can actually see where a claim comes from and investigate it further yourself. Again, it's not a requirement for posting on the internet and not everyone has the time or the ability or the resources to do it, but I personally believe it is important. And I think Dr. Idris has a right to feel whatever she wants to feel about wishing that she were claimed. Or again, Sandra did cite some medical case studies. She maybe could have done her best to tag some of the derms. But also, I mean, you watched the video, right? It's a little bit spicy. It's kind of a hot take. I can understand why someone like Sandra might not want to take the germs, even though the way that this kind of information spreads online, it's, it's kind of inevitable that even if someone wasn't tagged, someone's gonna point it out and that person is going to end up seeing themselves in it. Right? Well, Dr. Idris also mentioned that she created her facial depuffer and her other tools to help upgrade treatments like gua sha. That makes total sense. I can't speak to Dr. Idris's intention in creating this, but I can tell you, since Monica gave it to me, my first impressions on how it works. And I could see this being used on its own in a routine or alongside other tools and treatments. I actually do think that this would be great as part of a facial massage, lymphatic drainage, or if a traditional Chinese medical practitioner wanted to include this in a traditional gua 
sha treatment. It has arnica in it, which has been shown to help with bruising. Remember that gua sha, the word sha, literally relates to that petechiae, that kind of micro bruising under the skin, you could call it. So I actually think these could be very complimentary. As far as the gel, I did find it to be very viscous. I don't know how much I loved the gel and how much benefit I was seeing from the gel versus the actual depuffing roller. I loved the depuffing roller. But again, my usage of this was very on and off because I've been going through it. I've been having a rough time. And um, we'll have to speak in another video about my opinions of this. Subscribe so you don't miss it. But I don't know if my initial results and my initial opinions are from the gel itself or from the tool. Either way, I like that Dr. Idris does go into why she created it. And honestly, she's an expert who created something that she believes in. Just the way Sandra is an expert in her field and creates things that she believes in. And most importantly, in my opinion, Dr. Idris does state that it's dangerous to make medical claims without having enough data or a large enough sample size to support them. Now, <laughs> that is, ooh, that is a spicy comment. And we need to talk about that and what constitutes a medical claim. Sandra, in her video, did not say that gua sha cures hepatitis B. Sandra cited a source and did say that this can help with. Now, just because something can doesn't mean it will, right? She did not say that this cures hepatitis B. She said it can help with hepatitis B or inflammation and cited some sources. And again, just a minute, because we are going to talk about why misinformation runs so rampantly across the internet and kind of what's missing from right here that we are going to read in between the lines of and actually dig into. But back to the medical claims, this honestly gets into medical jargon and how the words that we use to make or not make certain claims uh, are policed. Uh, well, not really policed, but um, I guess regulated. This goes into what can and can't be written on products or what brands can and can't say in commercials. For example, as according to product regulations and claims, people can't just hold up a random product and say, this clears acne, unless it has ingredients that have been medically proven to do so. This is also why things like supplements aren't regulated in the USA. And it's why things like medications and drugs are regulated differently than over-the-counter products or just cosmeceuticals and cosmetics. And when it comes to what Sandra actually said, she said it can help with. That's not necessarily a medical claim, but again, a gua sha stone can be used as an ingredient in your salad. Just because it can be doesn't mean it should be, right? And even though it's not uh, technically a direct medical claim, I can see why Dr. Idris is calling it out and saying that it's potentially dangerous because it is insinuating that this treatment can help with something that is a medical condition and that we know based on medicine and data and research has no cure. So again, I wouldn't consider this a medical claim, but again, don't talk to me about that. <laughs> Go talk to a medical regulator. <laughs> now, one thing that Dr. Idris mentioned here is the small sample size. This is really important. And this is also why reading the studies in full is really, really important. Now, there are many different types of medical studies, some that are better than others. Some are case studies and some are peer-reviewed studies. Some are meta-analyses and some are double-blind, placebo-controlled Cochrane studies. Now, just because someone cites a source doesn't mean that that source is a good one. Just because someone shows a medical study doesn't mean the medical study was good or even free of bias. Studies and medical claims should be tested, ideally peer-reviewed. I mean, super ideally double-blind, placebo controlled. But most importantly, if something is claimed, it should be measurable and repeatable. Just because something happened to one person one time doesn't mean that that treatment is going to work for an entire population. We want to make sure that we are isolating our variables, that we are looking at all of the things that led up to that final result and taking them out one by one to see which one is actually causing the result, not just correlating or not just related to it. We also want to try to test and repeat this on others to see if it holds up for other people. And when it does, that's when it becomes something that we can actually use and publicly recommend. But let's actually look at this study that Sandra shows and specifically dive into what's going on here and into the science of hepatitis B. First, let's look at the study. This is what's called a case report. It is a case of one person, one patient that something happened to and the doctors wrote up a case report on it. This is very different than a meta-analysis or a peer-reviewed paper. This study is looking at someone who has chronic hepatitis B, and they're specifically looking at different markers inside of his body. Now, in order to understand what's happening in the study, we do gotta talk about hepatitis B. And I hope you're excited because I love this stuff. There are many different types of hepatitis. There's A, B, C, even D and E. But hepatitis B is specifically a viral infection of the liver. And this can be acute or short-term, or short-term, it can be short-term and acute 
acute or it can be long-term and chronic. Hepatitis B is actually relatively common and it can be spread through the transfer of bodily fluids in adults. This could be things like sharing needles or blood or seminal fluid or vaginal fluid or menstrual blood, but it can also be transferred from mother to baby, specifically when giving birth. The hepatitis B can be deadly specifically because it can cause liver cirrhosis, basically this scarring of the liver. It can also lead to liver failure and liver cancer, all of which can be really devastating. And the way this hepatitis B virus, also called HBV, works is very similar to other viruses. It's basically a virus that infects your body and it uses your own cells to replicate itself. And in HBV, this specifically happens inside of the liver. Now, the good news is that your body does have an immune system that helps to fight back. And the way that your body does that is very complex. But your body's immune system is so advanced and so specialized, it can actually create hepatitis B virus specific CD8 T cells. These T cells are like your body's little helpers. These are fantastic. Your body creates these to help clear the hepatitis B virus out of the body. The stronger the hepatitis B specific CD8 T cell response correlates with, again, doesn't cause, but correlates with viral clearance, meaning that your body can clear out the virus. Now, again, just because there's a correlation doesn't mean that it is definitive. And usually this happens in the acute or the short-term infections, not in that long-term chronic HBV viral infection. However, in those who have the chronic, the long-term hepatitis B infection, doctors and researchers have noticed that the presence of specific HBV CD8 T cells are barely detectable. So your immune system that is supposed to be there for you and help clear things out, those special cells aren't really there or they're kind of malfunctioning in people who have this chronic long lasting form. This prevents the body from being able to clear out the infection. And if the body can't clear it out, that's why it sticks around, which is why hepatitis B can become chronic or long term. Now in chronic hepatitis B infection, there's actually a lot of other stuff that can go wrong or can contribute to those T cells not working very well. But understandably, if someone's immune system can't create the cells that it needs to clear out the infection and perform the right way, it's understandable that they're going to have a very hard time recovering. Now, when it comes to this, thankfully, there are medications that can be used long-term not to cure this disease. It cannot be cured, but it can be mitigated. And there are medications that help slow it down, like slowing down the cirrhosis or the scarring of the liver, or that can really help with the side effects. You know, some people have diarrhea or vomiting, and there are medications that can help with those side effects. And here's the thing is that preventing Prevention is always easier than treatment. And the good news is that for most people who get hepatitis B later in life is that there's actually like an 85 to 90% success rate of the body being able to get rid of it themselves. Now for infants, that's much different. For babies, I think like, I think it's only 10% actually can get rid of it. Like 90% uh, actually really struggle with it. But that's also why babies are usually given vaccines within 24 hours of being born because we have medications that have been tried, tested and proven, not just just in one person, but over and over and over again. And we know that this medication can prevent a young baby or a child or an infant from getting this hepatitis B disease. Again, in adults, it's usually acquired through the swapping of bodily fluids, of sharing needles, of blood, etc. But in adults, a lot of times the body is able to take care of it. But that being said, there is no cure that we know of for hepatitis B. And here's the thing is that with hepatitis B, even the chronic form can resolve spontaneously meaning it can get better unexpectedly. Now, the acute form happens much faster. I think it takes like three or four weeks. And then by like six months, liver function is back to normal. And that's great news because for the majority of adults that do get hepatitis B, because again, it's very common, their body normally takes care of it. But with all of this knowledge of hepatitis B, we have to look at the way that this disease works and progresses and actually look at the case study that was done. You see, the case study, the one that Sandra is referencing, actually used gua sha on a patient who had the chronic form of hepatitis B. So there is basically this patient who is having this viral attack and it's happening to his liver and the doctors and practitioners decided to measure his blood and he decided to get gua sha. 
How about it? This case study specifically stated that they were looking at heme oxygenase 1, which is known to have a hepatoprotective effect. What is a hepatoprotective effect? Well, hepato, relating to the liver, protective, meaning it protects against, and the effect as a noun is the result, right? So this heme oxygenase 1 has been seen in rats, mind you, to protect liver function. They also state that gua sha has been seen to upregulate heme oxygenase 1, which again means that gua sha could potentially help the body produce more more of its own heme oxygenase 1. So this patient came in with chronic hepatitis B of the liver and they got gua sha. 48 hours after this guy got the gua sha, they did some measurements of his liver enzymes and of his body. And they found that his blood plasma had an increase of this heme oxygenase 1 and also that his liver enzymes were down. They were saying that this kind of points to the fact that there's less liver inflammation. They also noted a modulation of T helper cells. Remember, it's those specific T cells, specifically the HBV CD8 T cells that are responsible for clearing out the virus. So if we can see modulation or kind of an evening out of T cells, again, that doesn't prove that this person is getting rid of hepatitis B, but it is kind of a, a helpful thing to note. So basically at the end of the day, the patient was not all better, but 48 hours after receiving gua sha, their blood and their biomarkers seemed to be more in favor of the potential of healing. But the study then concludes that gua sha was shown to transiently reduce inflammatory markers of the liver injury in this human. Again, because a lot of the other studies have been done on rats. And together with the increase in heme oxygenase 1, this might be responsible for the hepatoprotective action. Now, again, this goes into medical claims. They're not saying it cures it. They're saying it might, just the way it can. That's kind of what Sandra said, right? But hold up, it doesn't say that this person is cured of hepatitis B. And based on what we know of hepatitis B, the chronic hepatitis B can be very deadly. It can be hard for the body to resolve, but that acute hepatitis can spontaneously resolve in some people can go away. And in the chronic long-term hepatitis B, just because this person's blood plasma or liver enzymes are looking a little bit better, doesn't mean that the disease has been either cured, definitely not, or even removed from the body or that the body was able to get rid of it. Now, another doctor saw this and said, hold the f up, what? <laughs> and decided to do a peer reviewed study. Again, this first case study is just reporting on what happened. And the sample size, as Dr. Idris called out in her comment, is of one. It's one guy that this happened to. Well, this other doctor, literally a year later said, I'm gonna do a study on this and I wanna figure out, is this real? Cause if so, this is revolutionary. And this other doctor did this on not just one person, but four people who have had hepatitis B and are inactive carriers and nine people that are non-carriers. So literally 13 people were tested instead of just one. And um, it's very interesting what happened. The doctors who did this study to fact check the first one literally called it, does gua sha offer hepatoprotective effect to chronic inactive hepatitis B carriers? Literally asking, does this work? <laughs> they said they were going to test it and oh, they did. So what they did is they took these 13 different people and they drew their blood both before and after gua sha. Two days, five days, and seven days after these people got a 15 minute gua sha treatment. When these doctors drew the blood, they specifically looked at some of the exact same things that the first study did. They're looking at heme oxygenase one, they're looking at cytokines, they're looking at liver enzymes, and they're looking at those special T helper cells. And here's the great thing, neither the participants or the investigator who administered the gua sha treatment were aware of the blood test results until after all of the data was collected for all of the participants. This isn't a placebo controlled double blind study, but this is a much higher quality of a study than just a case report. Well, guess what the results were? In both the inactive hepatitis B carriers, as well as the non-carriers, their liver function, their serum hemoxygenase one, and their Th1, Th2, cytokines did not significantly differ before and after gua sha. Yeah, basically they, they didn't see no nothing. They saw nothing. <laughs> so they conclude with this and in their conclusion, they literally contrast and kind of in medical science jargon say this is 
to the first study. Their conclusion literally states that in contrast to results in active hepatitis B carrier patients, gua sha did not induce any significant modulation or regulation of liver enzymes, or the heme oxygenase 1 that came from the blood plasma, or the cytokines in inactive hepatitis B carriers and the non-carrier participants, 13 of which they tested. They literally say that these current results suggest gua sha induced hepatoprotective effects which you you know means liver protective effects, depends on the inflammatory event or clinical stage of chronic hepatitis B. They say that because they tested both inactive and active hepatitis B carriers who were completely unaware of their liver status at the time of receiving this gua sha treatment, that the research protocol is effective in discounting the model that attributes the gua sha therapeutic efficacy to a placebo effect due to the participants' expectations. This new study that was done a year after the first one is literally in scientific jargon saying that is and the only reason there were positive results to the liver enzymes and the heme oxygenase 1 in the blood was because of the placebo effect. They literally called BS on it and they did a study to prove their point. Now, the placebo effect is very, very real. You know what it is. It's literally if you believe strongly enough that by taking a medication you're gonna get a certain result or something is gonna happen, your miraculous brain and your miraculous body can pull together and do it. And that is why something like a double-blind, placebo-controlled medical study is so much better than just a case report. And not everyone who believes that a medication will work will actually experience the placebo effect, but this has been tried and studied over and over and over again. If people believe in something strong enough or believe in a medication, they can get a result. It just goes to show that the mind is a very powerful thing, but it also goes to show there's a whole lot of we don't know. Our body can play tricks on us. Reality can play tricks tricks on us, and it is trippy. But it also goes to show that based on medical science that was placebo controlled, this first study saying that gua sha can help with hepatitis B is kind of at least that's what this second study shows. So specifically for this claim that gua sha can help with hepatitis B, why is this important? Well, it's important because if somebody hears this and they don't have all of the nuance and the information about gua sha and the study on which it was done to look at hepatitis B, maybe they're a hepatitis B carrier or they're suffering with it and they decide to stop taking their medication because the gua sha treatment will help them, right? Or maybe someone is going to chase down really expensive treatments and have false hope or get treatments that aren't right for them when they need to instead treat a condition or a new diagnosis much differently. Now, there's probably not a lot of harm in doing gua sha, whether or not you have hepatitis B. I again, stand to be corrected, but I don't think that like rubbing the body or causing petechiae or bruising on the body is going to make hepatitis B severely worse. But again, the real danger is if someone just got a diagnosis and needs intervention and doesn't do it, or if someone stops taking their medication, medication, or if someone doesn't know the nuance or the deep detailed things behind this medical study or gua sha as a scraping practice, it just bleeds into misinformation. And that's how, again, this medical misinformation is spread so wildly and so quickly online, which we are going to get to this chart that Lab Muffin Beauty Science created and talk about why this happens. And again, there's probably not a ton of harm in doing gua sha. You know, at least people aren't doing coffee enemas or putting ozone up their butt. Yeah, if you just know that some people are doing that for biohacking. We got another video to talk about with you. Again, are you subscribed? Because who the internet? Oh, the internet. Yeah, the internet. <laughs> but here's the thing. The science behind gua sha treating or helping with hepatitis B really is not that sound. Now, Sandra is not necessarily making a medical claim, but she's citing a source that really is not that accurate. It's just a case study. And it is a source that was later on debunked by a much more well put together peer reviewed study. But again, if someone has hepatitis B and wants to do gua sha or they get the placebo effect from it, there's probably not a harm if they do. As long as long as they have informed patient consent. This is one of the most important things and it means that every single patient understands the risks and benefits and has an informed understanding of every single side effect, risk, benefit of any medication or tool or treatment that they would receive. And that is really, really, really important. <laughs> but this is why we need to talk about nuance and medical misinformation. And again, I am not saying that Sandra is willingly spreading it because there's only so much you can say in a 
60 second clip, but also it is important to dive into the nuance of this, to read between the lines and to look for those secondary studies. And I don't know if Sandra has actually read the entire paper. I don't know if Dr. Idris has actually read the entire paper or if they've even seen or know of the existence of the second one. I don't even know if I fully understand either of them, right? There's definitely things that I or others are missing or when you read something, some people interpret the same data very differently. Sometimes it's incorrect or correct, or sometimes it is just a difference of opinion. But it is important to discuss these things and to discuss the nuance behind them, because as you can definitely see, this is a much longer conversation than just a sentence or two. That's why I'm literally on my second <laughs> cup of coffee. <laughs> but put on top of that, gua sha is a practice that has been used for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Just because we don't have any medical papers or any really up-to-date medical papers available in English talking about gua sha specifically and talking about the real gua sha treatment versus fake gua sha doesn't mean that it doesn't help to potentially boost immunity or could do something to liver function. It's just that based on our view from Western medicine, we don't have enough data to claim or substantiate that. Again, doesn't mean it doesn't work. It doesn't mean that Ayurvedic medicine doesn't work. It doesn't mean that traditional Chinese or Eastern medicine doesn't work. It just means that the Western world has not tested it enough. And before we continue to talk about what Sandra said and what Dr. Idris said and Dr. Dre, we do have to talk about how medical studies are actually funded because this is really important to figuring out why don't we know more about Eastern medicine from the Western medicine's perspective? Because obviously there are some people who have used this kind of stuff and these tools and treatments for thousands of years and they've seen amazing benefits. It's been healing. It's been amazing. Why don't we in the West talk about that? Well, think about it. For Western medicine to agree with it, there needs to be a study. It needs to be scientifically done. It needs to be repeatable. That takes a lot of time and money to do. Who's going to pay the scientists to conduct the study? Who's going to pay the patients inside of the studies to be a part of them? Who's going to fund all of that and put up the capital or the money to make it happen? Well, unfortunately, gua sha or some of these traditional Eastern medical practices are herbs or they are things that you can get from the ground. Now that's great, but you can't really make a lot of money off of them. And usually in Western medicine, the companies that have the money to give grants or funding to researchers or scientists or doctors are companies that have money because they are benefiting from the results of that study. This isn't 100% of the time, but it is quite often. And again, usually the companies that have a lot of money are the pharma companies. They can pay doctors and researchers to look into things because they're going to try to create a solution or a medication that they could make money from, which could then go back to the pharma company to hopefully put back into more research. But again, this is kind of and it can be really flawed because this pharma company is not going to look into this natural herb or this natural gua sha that they can't make money off of. There's just not going to be as much funding for this because there isn't a financial incentive for a company that is a business, you know, to look into that or to do so. And I'm not saying that it's right. This is just the way the system is built and we need to understand this. This is why it's also so important to read the entire medical study or the case study or the peer review. And you need to look at the bottom and see, did they declare any conflicts of interest, right? There are many studies that are done without conflicts of interest or that are not sponsored by a pharmaceutical company, but there are others that are. And you need to be aware of that and see that so that you can take that into consideration and into your analysis of any paper or any review. And again, I'm not saying it's good. I actually think it's f I don't like that that's the way it is. And that's the way it is now. And I hope that in the future, things challenge that because just like meditation, that has been used for thousands of years. Finally, the Western world is like, holy we're doing medical studies on this. This stuff is amazing. Fantastic. I wish we would have done that earlier. But unfortunately, the way that the system currently works, it is financially incentivized and uh, it's kind of halfway f <laughs> I don't like it, but it's the way it is. And you deserve to know that so that you can navigate it to the best of your ability. What that also means is that there are a lot of things that work for many people or that have worked for thousands of years that just haven't been proven in the Western world. It doesn't mean they don't work doesn't mean they're not a placebo effect, doesn't mean that it's not beneficial for some. It just means from our Western point of view that looks for quantitative and qualitative data that is repeatable, we haven't had the time or energy or money 
to do that and to prove yes, no, or maybe so. But the hepatitis B conversation isn't the only study that Sandra showed on screen. Dr. Idris didn't even mention the second study in her comment, but Sandra did show a study that looked at how gua sha could potentially help with inflammation. She also cites her source, which is awesome, so that you and I and anyone else can look at it and try to interpret it. Now, this study actually paid tribute to where gua sha comes from. They actually showed photos of traditional, real gua sha treatments, as we can see from this bruising. And they spoke about how gua sha is widely used in Eastern medicine and stated that they were going to test it. But here's the thing, they didn't test it in humans, they tested it in mice. And what they did is that they gave these mice gua sha treatments and little mouse vaccines, dermal vaccines, meaning vaccines into the skin. So after the mice got their gua sha treatments and their vaccines, these scientists and these researchers looked at their blood work. They also did cytometry to look at the little mouse cells and they did histology and looked at the mouse tissues under a microscope. And boy, they found some very interesting things. They specifically state that in the results, blood vessel expansion, erythrocyte extravasation, and and increased ratios of immune active cells were observed in the skin tissues following the treatment. The little mousy skin tissues, uh, yeah, after the treatment of gua sha, they saw a difference. They continue to say that pro-inflammatory cytokines were up-regulated and immunosuppressive cytokines were down-regulated in the treated and untreated skin and systemic circulation. No obvious variations were detected in case of anti-inflammatory cytokines. They then say that interestingly, intradermal delivery of a model vaccine following gua sha induced about a three-fold higher IgG titers with a more than Th1 biased antibody subtype profile. Basically, they measured things in the mice and they concluded that gua sha treatment can upregulate the innate and adaptive immune functions of the skin and boost the response against intradermal antigens. Thus, gua sha may serve as a safe, independent, and physical adjunct for intradermal vaccination. Now, this doesn't mean that it works in humans. This means that it kind of works in mice to potentially help increase immunity after gua sha, but also in vaccination. And this is actually kind of fascinating because when we give vaccines, there are reasons to not massage the skin and reasons to massage the skins. Specifically, vaccines can hurt, right? And it depends on if they're given intradermally or intramuscularly, but usually they go into the deltoid muscle. And when giving a vaccine, if it is massage, that can actually move the vaccine around and it can cause the entire arm to hurt. However, However, there have been studies showing that massaging the area could potentially help the vaccine work better in your body. So it can cause more irritation at the injection site, but it could potentially be better for your immunity overall. And what's fascinating is that, of course, gua sha is very different than massaging a vaccine injection site, but maybe, maybe there's something to be said about this or rubbing the area after a vaccine injection. There was literally an article about this in the Pediatric Infectious Disease Journal. It spoke about whether or not to massage after giving a vaccine. So this is not tried and true. We haven't repeated it and tested it over and over and over to my knowledge, but it could kind of be a thing. And again, this doesn't mean that gua sha doesn't work to help boost immunity, but it also doesn't mean that it is tried and true. And we don't really have the evidence or the repeatable science to be able to recommend it to large populations over and over until we have the time to study it and research it and say yes or no, or maybe, or or it's placebo. And I think that this entire conversation is a huge lesson in nuance. This is a treatment that is part of culture and history and has been used for thousands and thousands of years. And many people have seen amazing results. Many people have felt that it helped them through their sickness or it healed them. It's honestly so sad and devastating that Western medicine has not paid attention to this and done more research and looked into this more to try to see if they can validate it or not. But it's also difficult and unfair to suggest that this could be a replacement to other therapies or treatments and give some patients false hope. It also that the gua sha that we hear about is not actual or real gua sha. I think that so much rich culture and history is being flat out ignored by Western medicine, and let's be totally honest and upfront, by estheticians who don't know better and just think of this as lymphatic drainage and like rub a rock on someone's face. I think that this is actually an opportunity to get educated in Eastern medicine and culture and history, but it's also an opportunity to look at how medical misinformation is spread and how we 
need to dissect the claims that we hear online and how to have these difficult and very, very nuanced and lengthy conversations. And yeah, there are many other definitive benefits of gua sha, such as facial massage or such as circulation. We've seen this and it has been proven time and time again. But I also think that setting up doctors against TCM practitioners is not the best way to get answers. But it definitely gets spread quickly. It definitely sparks a hot take conversation. It definitely goes viral on the internet, but it doesn't necessarily bring us closer to the truth. So who's right? Sandra, a traditional Chinese medical practitioner, Dr. Idris with her line and her cosmetic practice, Dr. Dre as a dermatologist, none of them. <laughs> Nobody wins when we argue, but everyone wins when we take the time to listen, to educate ourselves, to form opinions, and then test those opinions in repeatable ways. And when we take the time to learn together, which is actually why I want you to comment and let me know if I left something out here or if I got something wrong. I'm sure I did because I'm a human and I make mistakes too. But like, please, number one, fact check me and my sources. But number two, what are your thoughts on all of this? Are you, like former me, somebody who thought that gua sha is just like rubbing a rock on your face and had no idea what gua sha actually is and the history of this amazing practice? Or are you someone who would have seen this on Instagram and thought, oh my gosh, this makes sense, it's so true, and shared it? Which goes back to what Lab Muffin Beauty Science said. She literally created this diagram with a couple of her colleagues and um, it talks about why misinformation is spread so quickly online. It triggers fear, it's really easy to understand and it's quick to share. Whereas having these nuanced conversations about some of these claims or some of these things being spread online, it takes time, it takes education, it takes citing sources, reading studies, and the burden really falls on that person who has to debunk that claim. It takes a second or two to share and to spread, but it takes a really long time to look at the sources, look at the studies, cite the data, and actually form an educated opinion based on some of those conclusions. And again, I'm not saying that Sandra is spreading medical misinformation. Information. I'm just saying that this is an example of how things that are catchy and simple to understand can really go viral and how sometimes we need to have more nuanced or lengthy conversations. And because in general, misinformation can spread so quickly, including the misinformation about what gua sha actually is, I for years thought it was just the rubbing the rock on the face. I had no clue. I'm actually going to ask you to share this video with someone that you can think of who might enjoy this conversation, who might enjoy the science behind this, or anyone that you know that uses gua sha or has thought about it and maybe doesn't know the true history behind it. And again, please fact check the sources that I've cited and call me out on what I can learn to do better too. Now for me, I'm gonna continue using my silk pillowcase thanks to Dr. Dre. I'm gonna continue testing out and reintroducing the Pillow Talk Derm Facial Depuffer from Dr. Idris into my routine. And I'm going to use my Lansheen Gua Sha tool anatomically, correctly, and in a way that will actually benefit me and pay tribute to the history and the culture of Gua Sha. And I'm also really tired and on my second cup of coffee, so I'm a little jittery and really excited to hear what you think about all this. Please let me know in the comments and most importantly, stay hydrated both orally and topically, reapply your SPF, and overall be beautiful both inside and out. And if you don't want to miss the future videos that I plan to do on gua sha and trying to resurrect some of that old footage and even talk about some other things like the coffee enemas and people putting ozone up their butts, <laughs> make sure that you subscribed and hit the notification bell to say all so that you don't miss it when I produce that. Because I have been getting back into the swing of videos and, you know, trying to use my different pillows and now my new fancy mattress to sleep a normal amount of time to not cry every day. And I will be using different things to debuff my face because I, I'm i still in emotion a little at the end of the day, okay? I don't know when I'm gonna get over this. Maybe I never will, but hey, I'm adjusting to my new normal, all right? And actually, if you made it to this point in the video, please leave an emoji in the comments. Like say in the comments, oh my God, I can't believe she did insert emoji here. Have some fun with it. Let's confuse everybody else. Like literally use the words, oh my gosh, I can't believe she did and then insert your emoji of choice. And the reason why is because it'll tell me who actually watched this entire video, who understands the nuance, right? Who understands all the intricacies that we discussed here. And for everybody who didn't, Again, this is why misinformation can spread so quickly on the internet because people don't get the full picture and then they'll be confused. They'll be like, oh, she did what? And then they'll actually watch the video. They'll actually get the knowledge and then they'll end up here. So they actually understand the full conversation and the full nuance that we discussed today. Anyways, I can't wait to see your emojis. I can't wait to hear what you think. It's a lot. <laughs> it's very interesting and I'm excited to dive into it more. Okay, now I'm actually done with the video. Love you and can't wait to see you in this next one. <laughs> Love you guys. Bye.